Okay. Everyone can hear me all right? Thumbs up? Great. All right, well, welcome everybody to the Symbiota Support Group for March 2023. We're excited that you are here. And uh, we have a really exciting topic to talk about today, I think. Um, first, I'm going to make just a few announcements. First of all, if you are here, you probably have gotten our communications about the Symbiota Support Hub. But if you haven't, um, make sure to uh, connect your colleagues with uh, hub at symbiota.org because they're good. that's the email address you're going to be receiving uh, emails from with our communications. We also have some upcoming uh, conferences that the Symbiota Support Hub is going to be attending and often presenting at. So if you're going to be in San Francisco for the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections meeting, we will be there, um, as well as at the Digital Data Conference, which is the week after that. So that's going to be in, Arizona, uh, in Tempe, Arizona, at the Arizona State University, which is the uh, current home of the Symbiota Support Hub. So that's exciting. Katie, um, can I ask a quick question about this sure. information? Um, it was my understanding, this is with respect to spinach, and I don't know if your slide, it went by so quick, if you showed a date or time. My understanding, um, I think that is, at least part of it is virtual. I mean, I was hoping or planning to attend virtual, so I'm curious if you know the day or time, I assume field trips are not part of a virtual option, but do you think, or is it your understanding that this is going to be provided virtual also? There is a virtual attendance option. So if you go to the Spinach 2023 website, they'll have like a, um, uh, they'll, they'll tell you more about registration and they also have like a skeletal schedule there too. So the dates are um, down here at the bottom right, May 28th through June 2nd. And so that would be a great way to connect if you can't travel to San Francisco or you don't want to at that time. Um, it's also cheaper. It's only $250 to um, participate virtually versus much more if you participate in person. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't seen the grid. I know May 28th, the Sunday is field trips only, Monday is workshops only, but this isn't a workshop symposium. So Tuesday is kind of mystery. I think it's um, some of their working groups and then I think Wednesday and Thursday will be the symposia and other things. That's so correct. I'll, yeah. I'll look into that more, but thank you for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. And we don't know which day our symposium is going to be on yet. So stay tuned for that exact date, but this is the date range. All right. And then digital data is the week after that. Um, and it also has a potential virtual participation option, which is um, pretty inexpensive too. So really great presentations at both of these conferences. Make sure you tune in if you can. And then um, as a, an exciting announcement, we have the whole team together today. You might have noticed that Lindsay is lurking in the background here. And even better, we have the entire team and I'm gonna try to spotlight them here. Spotlight for everyone. There we go. The whole Symbiota support group team is here today. Um, there's Jen Yost in the front. Jen, raise your hand. We have Ed Gilbert is here, Nico Friends, and Greg Post. I know your last name. <laughs> there's Samantha Oriana. There's Laura Rocco Prado. And then we have a new team member uh, back. This is Mark Fisher. He's going to be a developer with Symbiota Support Hub. So really excited to have everyone joining us today. Um, from Arizona State University. We're in the ASU bio collections. So that's why we have these lovely specimens behind us. And then of course, Lindsay Walker. I already Hi, said everybody. her, but <laughs> Lindsay's here too. So yeah, fun group here today. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about some FAQs. So today's topic is frequently asked questions. So these are things that we often get from users of multiple levels of skill and multiple levels of um, uh, frequency. 
And we are just gonna go through these because they're helpful general knowledge for the entire community to know. And we have a couple of different topics or um, kind of groupings of these types of questions. We're gonna talk about some general symbiota network questions um, about searching and downloading. There are lots of um, ways that you can kind of improve your searching and downloading experience that we'll talk about. We'll talk about collection management and also digitization. And so we have a lot of questions to talk about and we're gonna walk through those. Um, but if you had a question and it doesn't show up in this presentation, then feel free to ask it at the end, um, or you can always send us an email at help at symbiota.org and we'll be happy to um, answer your questions. Okay, so there are some very general questions, like one is how do I join a portal? And that does differ depending on the portal. So if you um, know what portal you want to be in, or maybe even if you don't, you can um, go to this website um, that checks out which symbiota portals exist and find out which one your collection fits into the scope of. So are you um, having invertebrate collections? Do you have plant collections, whatever? Then once you go to that um, portal website, there should be information there. If there's a portal manager, they should be listed on the home page. And so your first step is to reach out to the portal manager if they are listed. Sometimes there's a portal manager email address there. Um, so reach out to them, and if you don't see that or you don't get any response from the portal manager in a couple of weeks, feel free to reach out to the Symbiota Support Hub. Um, and again, that's help at symbiota.org. Okay, this has come up a lot in the last year or so. What do I do if I don't remember my username or password? Well, first off, don't create a new account because um, you have all of these edits and things that have been done with your previous account and you're basically losing credit from those things that happened um, if you make yourself a new account. So if you don't have access to your email address that you previously used, or if you forget your um, email address or you forget your um, password, then you can use the, the reset links on the, um, on the portal. So I'm gonna bring a portal over here just to show you real quick. So if I logged out, um, and then I was trying to get into my into a portal and I click log in down here there's some options to reset password or retrieve login so retrieve login will um, send an email to the email address if you don't have access to that email address then you'll just want to um, email help at symbiota.org and ask us about updating your email address and if you can't remember your password then go ahead and click reset password and we know that this has um, kind of only worked marginally for some people in the past year or so because there have been some institutional firewalls that have blocked that password reset. So if that becomes a problem for you, just email us at help at symbiota.org. Okay, another big question we get is what is Signet? So Signet is... Um, a, a giant mega database basically of nearly 400 herbarium collections. So these are plants, mostly vascular plant collections. And this giant mega database is connected to, um, to multiple front end portals. And so here's kind of like a, a graphical re representation of that, where you have this database in the center. This is all the data. And then there are multiple ways of accessing that data, but it's all the same data. So the Consortium of Midwest Herbaria, the Consortium of Southern Rocky Mountain Herbaria, um, CERNEC, TORCH, a bunch of portals are connected to the same database. So what that means for you is that if you log in to a portal that is in the SciNet network is what we call it, then uh, you can actually use the same credentials in any other SciNet network portal. Um, so if you have a user account in the um, North American network of smaller barrier, you can also log in to, uh, you know, you know CERNIC, for example. So one point of clarification is that not all herbarium portals that are in the Symbiota system are connected to Signet. So there are several herbarium based portals that are not Signet network. And that includes the Consortium of California Herbaria. Um, the Consortium of Northeastern Herbaria, Open Herbarium, and then a couple of others that 
are um, in various processes of being um, created or revamped. And um, so if you can't log into an, one of the portals using your Signet network um, login credentials, then you know it's not part of the Signet network. And some of these, uh, some of the herbaria in the Consortium of California Herbaria and the Consortium of Northeastern Herbaria share a snapshot of their data with um, Signet. So for example, you might find the UC Riverside Herbarium in Signet, but you will also find it in the Consortium of California Herbaria. Its main living place, um, actually in both places, it's a snapshot, but um, you'll have a copy of it that is like where it's live managed, usually um, in, in the case of the UC Riverside Herbarium, it's just a snapshot, but you might have an additional copy in Signet. So you might say like, hey, why is there data in um, you know, CCH2, but I can't find that same data in Signet? Well, because it might be a snapshot in Signet in that example, um, and that snapshot isn't necessarily up to date. So I'll talk a little bit more about why you might see differences in data in two or more portals in the, uh, another question, but that's just kind of you know, your teaser. Oh, and speaking of which, here we are. So why is some data in X, let's say some portal or some website, but not in some other portal? We get this a lot because people are confused when you know, they upload data to one portal and then they try to look for it somewhere else and they don't see it. Um, and this happens for various reasons, but usually just because not everything is perfectly synced and perfectly up to date. So for example, um, you might have a collection that is in one portal, one database, or an aggregator, but uh, it's not in another aggregator. So for example, um, the, um, let's say the, the Pacific Grove Museum might be in CCH2, but it's not in Signet, and maybe it's not in the GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility Aggregator as well. Um, that's just because those two portals or that portal and that aggregator have not shared any data. So things that are in Signet or CCH2 or whatever are not automatically imported into aggregators like IDIG Bio and GBIF. There are a couple of steps that need to happen before the data can go from one portal to another. And that might just have never been created. So um, in the case of GBIF, you just have to register with them before you can push your data to GBIF. Um, and maybe they just haven't done that. So it's possible to send data between those two, but it requires someone from that institution to um, do it. So and sometimes not, that capacity isn't always there or there's they're publishing in some other way or there's some other reason. Um, and this is a reminder that you will often have data that comes from um, another Symbiota portal or some other database, and that's what can, can come into Symbiota portals. And that Symbiota portal, if it's a snapshot, is only as up to date as the last copy of data that's been added into the portal. So that's why you'll have some um, out of date data sometimes. Um, and I kind of already touched on this, where if you find some data that's in a portal, but it's not in GBIF or IDIC bio. It could be either because the, um, the collection isn't registered at all in GBIF, so it just has not pushed those buttons to push it to GBIF. Or if you see like, hey, there's only 200 specimens in GBIF, but there's 500 specimens in my collection, then that might mean that you just have to um, update, click the button to refresh your data to GBIF. That's not an automatic process. Um, sending data to IDIC Bio and to GBIF is neither automatic nor instantaneous. So um, you've got to make sure to, to push those buttons. And we can answer questions about that after um, we walk through these questions too. Um, for IDIC Bio, it could be for multiple reasons. Maybe the collection hasn't asked IDIC Bio to ingest their data. Um, maybe the collection hasn't published a Darwin Core archive, so created a little package of data that IDIG Bio can pick up, or it could just be that IDIG Bio hasn't ingested their data yet. As I mentioned, IDIG Bio and GBIF harvesting is not instantaneous, so um, it might just be a, a lag. Um, and then if you see differences in what data is in one 
symbiota portal versus another symbiota portal. That could be because they are out of sync. So you have new data here and old data here, and that um, connection hasn't happened. For a lot of portals, we at the Symbiota Support Hub update snapshot data monthly, but it really depends on the originating collection because some of the originating collections upload spreadsheets, some of them are linked to IPTs, there's all sorts of ways that data can get into portals, and some of them are easier to update than others, so sometimes they're just not updated. And feel free to, if you if you have like a, a specific reason why you want to see or need to see the data updated in a certain um, portal, feel free to reach out and ask about how those can be updated. Some Sometimes it can't be updated because there's a digitization project going on at that time. Um, but um, in some cases it could just be, oh, we haven't refreshed it for a while and we just need to figure out how to do that. Okay, and I mentioned this earlier that if there are certain specimens or data that you don't see in iDigBio or GBIF, again, it's just a case of um, stale data that needs to be refreshed. Hey, Katie, let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah, for sure. There's a question in the chat about the occurrence ID following the records. Great, yeah, Scylla is asking, is the OCC ID for a record for all the portals connected to Sinet the same as Sinet's OCC ID for that corresponding record? Yes, Scylla. So because all the data in Sinet are literally in the same pool, all the data corresponding to that specimen is gonna be the same in all of the portals. So every number, every OCC ID is gonna be the same. The only thing that's different is like, the URL to access that specimen. But the reality is, is that if you just took away like the CERNIC part of the URL and you replaced it with torch URL, you would actually get to the same specimen record. Um, you know, as long as you keep the tail that has all the identifying information for that specimen. Great question though. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one bit to it because this is a point of confusion for a lot of people. And so I, if, if any of you still find yourself confused, feel free to interrupt and jump in. But for my collection, I manage my records live within a symbiotic portal called CCH2. But then um, I publish a snapshot of my records to Sinet, a different symbiotic portal. And so sometimes people who are searching Sinet will comment on my records in Sinet. I still get pinged. Then I edit those records in the live version of their data in the CCH2 portal. And because I push data between those two portals, then it all gets synced up. But like Katie said, it's about a monthly, um, every month it gets refreshed. Does that make sense to everybody who's here? If there's any lingering questions, just keep asking about it because we do get asked that a lot. Yeah, and that also leads us into a similar question. Um, can I edit my records in two different portals at once? And I'm going to say that the short answer is you shouldn't. Um, so generally, you have data from Symbiota Portal A, and it's going into Symbiota Portal B. And I'm going to kind of explain why I say you shouldn't edit it in two portals at once. Um, there is not a very good way of bringing the data back in from Portal B unless you only want, want what was in Portal B. So there should be one portal that is your um, uh, your like canonical data, and then you just put copies of it into appropriate other symbiota portals. So the reason for this is let's pretend that we have all of our data and it's in this Sinet portal. I've just pictured it as a picture because it has all of our data in it. And then we put just like a subset of it, for example, in the Torito portal, which is like the Fern portal. So we just kind of put a little bit of our data into this Fern portal. Well, when we make a change in the Sinet, then if we want that change to be shown in the Torito portal, no problem. We just pour that in. Anything that gets imported as a, a Darwin Court import will totally overwrite what was previously in, um, in this case, the small, the Torito portal picture. So when a snapshot is updated, uh, is refreshed, you're completely replacing the data. Everything from picture A is going into picture B. Well, anything that you wanted to put in there is um, going up and replacing what was previously there. 
okay, but then what if you make some edits in portal B and then, oh shoot, well, and I want to refresh my snapshot, then you're going to replace anything that you edited in portal B, um, in Torito portal in this example. So anything that you edit there just gets completely washed out if you update your snapshot. Well, what if you make an edit in portal A and then an edit in portal B? Well, shoot, like how do I get the portal B edits into the portal A and then the portal A edits into portal B? There's really no way of um, joining those two data sets together in uh, a nice fashion. You could technically go to the timestamp of every edit and compare them, but there's no sort of tool that allows you to do that. And even if there would, you would still have to make a judgment call about which one you wanna keep. So there's not a really a, a good easy way of meshing data sets together if they've been edited, in, edited independently. So make a plan for when, when and if you're going to put your data in more than one portal. Make sure you know which one is where the data is gonna be live managed and try to focus on only live managing in that portal. Can I make a comment? Yeah. This is Ed. So we are working on solutions where you can actually do transfers across portals like that. Um, and we have stuff in the works. Um, it's still going to be a while longer before that's there. But it is a hard problem if you're doing edits in both portals, navigating how those edits go across. So even once we have those tools together, we're going to have to do a lot of like testing, trial and error. Um, to get it going in a situation where you're doing your ferns in one portal or your Africa specimens in a portal and you want to transfer that data over, it's um, it'll be easier if it's different specimen data sets that you're dealing with and you're just pulling over rate only stuff over. But um, but still, it is a hard problem. So, but we're getting there. Yeah, good point, Ed. And, oh, I just wanted to make a comment that you might think like, oh, but like, I will just know that we're only gonna work in this portal and then we're gonna take that copy of the data and we're gonna import in that one. And meanwhile, we're never gonna touch these 3000 specimens in my portal. The reality is, is that won't happen because if you have more than one person working in your portal, like someone will forget, someone will not know, someone will get a new job, and you're gonna suddenly start editing the data in two places, even though you intended to only edit it in one place. Um, so just, or you intended to edit it in two places and then be very careful about merging the two. Like it's best practice to put up a foolproof solution that is edit here, don't edit here. There are, of course, caveats to that, and you can set up your own workflow however you want. But if you want to prevent data um, versioning issues in the future, then I would recommend just editing it in one place. I'm going to check the chat real quick. Um, Allison asks, is this a reason to enter each group of plants and each regional collection into a different portal? Um, and Jen answered, yeah, you would want to publish snapshots to the other regional portals, only snapshots. So you don't enter the data in that other portal. You enter it in your portal and then just put a copy of a subset of your data into the other portal. Okay, now we're into the searching and downloading portion. So these other questions. So there's kind of the very simple question of how do I search for you know, something very specific in a portal. And as you've probably seen, um, the, the public search functions in portals are somewhat limited. Um, and there are reasons for that that I won't get into, but if you're just in the public interface, you can search by taxonomic, locality, um, collector, and specimen criteria. And in this particular portal, you can also search by trait criteria. But if you're looking for something much more specific than that, um, there are a couple of ways that you can get a more specific um, search. And so one of those is using the record search form. And you can do this only within collections that you have editing access to. So this is a way that you can do very specific searches 
in your collections or collections that you can edit. And so to do this, you will go log into your account. Let me pull myself off screen to do that real quick. Okay. So I'm logged in. And if I go to my profile, occurrence management, and then the name of the collection that I want to manage or I want to search in this case, then you'll go to this little section that says edit existing occurrence records. So if I click edit existing occurrence records, it's going to take me to the record search form and give us just a moment. And what we see here is a much more specified record search form that can be used to look for look in almost every field in the database. So there are some um, kind of boilerplate fields here. So collector, number, date. But if you want to search something very specific like substrate or occurrence remarks, then you can select them from this custom field here. So almost every field that you can import data into is in this list. So if you wanted to search very specifically in the georeference remarks for any time someone you know, said the word intersection, then you can do that right here. That's not something you can do on the public search side. Um, even more specifically, you can do um, and or searches using this too. So you can add a lot of different search terms at once. And these are a little bit confusing, but uh, if you think of them kind of mathematically, they're pretty easy to use. What these little side um, drop down menus are is these are to hold kind of parenthetical statements. So it, what if I said I wanted anything that has the georeference remarks that contains intersection and um, it had a country equals United States. And let's close my parentheses here. Or it is, and then you can make a new parenthetical statement here, um, you know, catalog number equals, I don't know, whatever else you'd want to put in here. So you can make actually really complex queries that combine and and or statements or separate them with parenthetical statements um, so that you can look for specifically that very thing that you're looking for. Um, and then I will note in this drop down menu here, there are lots of different types of searches you can do. One thing that I really like to use is the is null and the is not null options because those will help you find things that are missing data or have data and they're not supposed to. So um, that's a good thing to use there. And then if I click reset form, it's going to get rid of all of my other search statements. And once you do a search, um, so let's just say I want to get everything that is stage one. Once you do a search, um, the little record search form disappears and you might be like, oh shoot, I have to go all the way back and then all the way back in. No, all you gotta do is click this little tiny magnifying glass here and it'll bring your record search form back open. So that's a really good place to do a very specific search right there. Um, let's see. Scylla asks, is there a way to search the determination table without downloading all the data? Not yet, but coming soon. Are there any plans to add additional search options to the public search? That's a good question, Miranda. And I think that depends on the portal. Um, the reason why a lot of the um, stuff is not searchable on the public side is because um, usually those are text searches, which take a very long time. So people would run a text search and then be like, oh, it's not working, it's broken. And then, you know, get frustrated. So um, that's why most of them aren't there. Okay, let's get out of here. And I talked about uh, multiple fields and or functionality parenthetical statements. Um, and then another simple way of doing a search, if you want to do that very specific search, but you want to use data that's not just yours, that also belongs to someone else, it could just be as simple as going to the home, doing a search, 
you know, let's look for anything in San Luis Obispo County. And then you can just download the data and search in Excel. Like usually the spreadsheet is not that big. You could do those very custom searches by yourself. So here's where the download button is. You could download it in multiple different formats and that'll allow you to do specific searches too. Okay, I think I see some questions in the chat. Um, let's see. The entered by field would be useful, except it appears to be tied to some form of my name that I cannot figure out. Can you explain? Yes, I can. So the, the entered by, which you, you might've seen as an option in that record search form. Um, if, you, if you click, um, actually I should just show you. Go up back in here, back into my profile. I'm gonna go into, let's just go into this collection. In my record search form, this entered by, if you click CU, that says limit current record, limit to recent records submitted by current user. That's going to enter in your username and the date that you entered. So that's like anything I, I did today. So the number or the um, entered by person that it's looking for is your, your username. So you have to enter your username as it appears on your personal profile for that to come up in the search results. And if you're not sure what it is, then you can just click the see you button and then it will show up. And then Megan, I think that answers your question too. Just put their username in there. Okay, how can I download a subset of data? Well, I showed you one way and that's just doing the public search. So you go in, do a search, download with that little download button. Um, and if you're a collection administrator, there's actually an additional tool for you. And Lindsay's gonna put a link to the tutorial information for this in the chat. But if you go into the administration control panel and you click the processing toolbox, there's a tool here called exporter. And that's where you can do a more specific search, not quite as specific as the record search form, but still you can do like up to three fields. Um, and then yeah, normal download options. So that can get your, um, get your data set narrowed down a little bit more. Okay, why aren't some specimens showing up in my search? This happens a lot and is, um, for a lot of reasons. So sometimes it's very specific, but one reason that um, happens is because some, or I think most all collections in the search options. So let's just say I'm doing this search in CCH2. If you scroll down, you'll see that one of the specimen criteria options is to include captive or cultivated occurrences. Usually by default in most portals, captive or cultivated specimens are being excluded from your search by default. So you'll just need to make sure that if you're looking for things that might include captive or cultivated occurrences, that you check that box. Um, you might also not be able to find specimens because they have a non-standardized country or state or county value. So um, not not all instances of um, one state name are linked to one another and there would, therefore would be able to be searched in the same search. So if you look for, um, you know, like Nuevo Mexico, like you're probably not gonna find all the same records that you would find as you search for New Mexico or NM. So we encourage everyone to use one standard word. So New Mexico in that case, but you might find that, you know, because every collection has their own way of entering their data, um, they might have entered it in a different way. So if you don't see um, certain specimens, it might be because they have a different value in that field. So when you want to do a very fully inclusive search, you probably want to search variations on the spelling and, and, and typography of whatever you're looking for. This one is really common. Um, sometimes you won't find a specimen because it has a non-index scientific name. So that means that that scientific name isn't in the taxonomic thesaurus. And um, that means that if you 
do a search for a genus or a family, for example, then the, um, the portal is not going to know that it should be linked to this particular scientific name. And we'll talk more about getting taxonomic names into the um, portal and the thesaurus in a moment, but that's a really common one. So what you can try to do is if you're not finding a specific scientific name um, in, the, in the taxonomic or in, in a search, then you might have to search for that specific taxonomic name and see if those um, those links will, well, if those scientific names are linked to someplace. Because if a scientific name is linked to the taxonomic thesaurus, then what you should be able to see is, um, search here. If you do a search in list display, and then you have a name like this, once it loads, you should be able to see a link to the scientific name. Or maybe I'm speaking out of turn. I thought that it did. Hmm. Well, maybe none of these names are indexed. Hold on, let me check for different collection. Okay, it looks like maybe California Academy of Sciences, not to call you out, sorry, is currently not indexing a lot of the names. But normally, um, if it's indexed to the taxonomic thesaurus, you should see a link to the scientific name. So that actually showed me a red flag in the beginning that, oops, I need to make sure that the CAS or the California Academy names are being indexed correctly. Um, because if they were, I would see a link here that takes me to the taxonomic page for that record. So if you don't see that, that means that your scientific name isn't in the taxonomic thesaurus. Okay, um, and then it also might be that the scientific name isn't linked to all the applicable synonyms or children taxa. So you might be like, I searched um, Aster and I'm only seeing these certain scientific names or maybe not all the varieties are showing up. That might be because the, um, the taxonomic name was imported but then wasn't correctly connected to all of its synonyms or maybe the synonyms aren't in there. So um, you might have to check on that too. So check on that name in the taxonomic thesaurus, see what its synonyms are. And if they aren't uh, what you uh, expect them to be, then let the portal manager know. Okay, big question we get often, who maintains the taxonomic thesaurus and who decides what's accepted? Well, the short answer is the portal managers and you. So there is not like one higher body in most portals that are the, um, the gods of the taxonomy. Usually these are community curated things. Um, that means that we need import from, input from taxonomic experts in a lot of cases. Sometimes there are really well organized groups of people who are managing the taxonomy really closely, like in the lichen and the bryophyte portals. Like they're, they may not be perfect, but they are actually watching that taxonomy pretty closely. There are other portals that are just so huge that they are not necessarily following one taxonomic concept or they might not be following one taxonomic um, um, you know, treatment. And in the case of something like Sinet, how can you decide what is, who's going to be the authority when you have 400 collections that you're working with? The bottom line is that the taxonomic thesaurus is a data discovery tool and not necessarily a taxonomic resource. You might, or authority, you might, um, be able to create a taxonomic authority file or be able to curate a taxonomic thesaurus in a way that it becomes a taxonomic authority. But, and I think I'm lagging a little bit here, um, but the purpose is, is so that you are able to find specimens that are related to that taxonomic um, name. So it's not necessarily so that we can decide who is right when it comes to one particular scientific name or another. Megan, that's a good question about, um, Megan says, how do we disseminate this information to our portal users that might not know they're missing specimens due to linkage to the thesaurus? That's an excellent question and probably could use further consideration within the portal communities. Like there probably should be information 
on the data use policy page that explains like potential gaps and such. So that would be a really good idea to have um, uh, a discussion in a portal community about. And if you wanna learn more about this concept of the taxonomic thesaurus um, more deeply than we're gonna to cover today, obviously, we have a pre-recorded um, previous symbiota support group meeting uh, that you can go and uh, look, at, look at and watch. It had uh, a lot more in depth than we're gonna be able to cover right now. Okay, so um, next question we're going into kind of collections management is how do I add names to the taxonomic thesaurus? And again, this always depends on the portal because if you have a portal community that closely manages the taxonomy, they'll probably, uh, there'll be some vetting process. Um, but it really depends on the portal management. So um, you'll wanna contact your portal manager with the taxon name, with the taxonomic name authorship, and also a link to the taxonomic authority or citing the publication. So for something like Signet, what we generally do is if a name is published, we will add it into the taxonomic thesaurus because that facilitates better searching and linking. Um, and you know, we just consult whatever reference is given to us about whether it's accepted or not accepted. So feel free to reach out to the portal manager or if you can't find the portal manager, you can reach out to help at symbiota.org. Um, and then, so a super administrator or a taxon administrator can add taxa to the taxonomic thesaurus. And in some cases, some portals have active taxonomic managers who are working to add taxa to the portal. And so if you think that that might be um, of interest to you, if you are a taxonomic expert on some uh, particular, even a subset of species, then feel free to get in contact with that portal and see if they would be um, up for your help. Okay, and then another general question, how do I get data into a portal? And that's a really big, long question, um, but I'm gonna just point you to several really good resources that can help you with this question. It kind of depends on what format your data currently are in. Um, we can handle spreadsheets, CSVs, things like that, Darwin Core archives, or um, derivatives thereof. So Lindsay's gonna put a bunch of links into the chat that will lead you to these pages that you can use. So we have data, uh, we have information in Symbiotis docs. We also have an entire Symbiotis support group meeting that was talking about uploading data into a portal. So definitely recommend going and looking at that if you have any questions about uploading data. Um, also related, we had an updating snapshots Symbiota support group, and that was last month. So that's nice and fresh, and you should be able to get some information there if you're interested in how um, Darwin Court archives and IPTs can connect to a Symbiota portal too. Okay, another question, how do I manage who has access to my data? Um, well, so any data that you put on a Symbiota portal is automatically public. Um, minus any data that you have the locality redacted for. So if you go into your specimen record and you check that little box that says uh, redact locality, then um, you can, then, then those data will be, they'll be public if it's not checked, private locality if it is checked. Um, and let me show you an example and also where you can manage um, kind of editing access to your data too. So again, I'm back here in my um, data editor control plan panel, and any administrator can go into this manage permissions right here, and then it will give you a list of all the um, administrators, editors who have access to your data. So only administrators can get to that page and can provide the access or revoke the access as desired. Um, but it's a good idea to kind of look in that every year and just kind of see, oh, oops, like those students have moved on a long time ago. Maybe I should just revoke their access. It doesn't remove any like edits that they have made or anything. It just means that they can't go in and make edits in the future. All right, a similar question is how can I change the description and contacts for my collection? And it's really easy. All you do is in the administration control panel, you click 
edit metadata. Metadata is just data about your data. So this is the data about the data set you are um, curating. So you edit the description here. And then if you go into contacts and resources, this is where you can add contacts or remove contacts or change your mailing address or whatever you need to do right there. And that's what I just showed. Okay, just a few more questions. I know we're coming to the end of the hour here. So one of them is how can I get my images into the portal? And this is a big question and it has kind of a complex answer. And I'm first gonna just say that the two main options are you can host images with the Symbiota Support Hub. So that means taking your physical images and putting them on servers belonging to the Symbiota Support Hub and then we'll facilitate the linking of those images to your um, records in this in the portal. Images, as we've mentioned in a previous Symbiota support group, don't live in your portal. Like when you upload to um, upload an image to a portal, it doesn't actually live in the same database that all your normal data does. It actually lives in some other server. So you can set that up with the Symbiota support hub um, to put your images actually in our servers, and we can link them nicely. Um, or you can provide URLs of your own. So if you have a nice server that is web accessible, so that's a big asterisk is it has to already be a web accessible server, um, then you can provide us URLs or lists of URLs um, so that you can link those images to your specimen records and um, that they will live on your own servers but can be viewed through the portal. And we did an, a whole webinar on this as well. So um, make sure you check out the Symbiota support group about getting images to a portal if you have more questions about that. And feel free to get in contact with us if you're like, oh, I'm interested in um, hosting images with a Symbiota support hub. We're up for that too. Okay, so then there are just a few questions that are kind of more curatorial, and I'm just going to show you some examples of what some people in the community do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is what everyone does, or that it is the um, uh, standalone best practice. This is just how one useful way of doing this. So for example, one question we have is, how do you deal with multi-sheet specimens and mixed specimens? So in the plant world, what you might have is a really, really big leaf that doesn't fit onto one sheet of paper or you know a branch or whatever. And um, you might split that up into several specimens. Or similarly, you might have um, one, um, one creature and you have like the skull here and the skin here and uh, lots of different pieces of it spread about in different collections. So what we recommend with this is, or at least what we have seen done in for this is that you can create two separate records. Oh, this is an example of a um, mixed specimen. Let me go to this one first. So this is an example of, this is the top of the plant. And then this is the middle of the plant or maybe just one of the, or just a couple of the leaves. Um, and as you can see down here, it says sheet three of the three and this one says sheet one of three. So there are multiple specimens here. Um, and what this collection has chosen to do and what a lot of herbarium specimen collections have done is create two completely separate records in the Symbiota portal. And the reason for that is it's because it's two separate um, collection objects. And um, in the botanical world, this is philosophically the same thing as a specimen duplicate. This is not shared within all collections, but um, you know, a duplicate specimen could easily be from the same individual as well. So these are botanical duplicates and you can treat them as just individual specimens, but they happen to be parts of one another. Um, but when you do that, you want to make sure that you connect these according to, um, well, if you can, connect them as linked occurrences. So for this example, um, in that specimen record, and I don't remember whether I had a link to that record before, but let me open up the specimen record. What you could do is in linked resources, you could create a new association 
that links one of your specimens to another one of your specimens. And what you could do is use the catalog number. So I could search for some catalog number and then I could say relationship is um, something probably like shares originating sample or no derived from same individual would probably be more accurate for if it's like a multi-sheet specimen. So then you could um, programmatically attach your two specimens to each other because they are the same individual and you can uh, put that in a machine readable format. Okay, let me go over here and then go back one because this is an example of a mixed specimen. So I know this happens a lot with lichens and bryophytes too because you collect one rock and it has 10 lichens on it. Um, but in, in like um, the vascular plant world, what we usually do is we apply um, multiple barcodes. So each specimen that has its own taxonomic identification is going to get its own record. So it has its own unique identifier and its own record. And that would correspond to the, your own record in the database as well. Um, and then what's really nice is that when you're entering your data in here, if you're live managing your collection and you entered the collector number and date, if you click this duplicates tool, if this is enabled for your collection, then you'd be able to import the same locality data. So if you've, if you've entered it once, you don't have to re-enter it 10 times. You could just use the duplicates tool to search for the record. And if you find it, in this case, there's no duplicates, but if you find it, there would be a pop-up box that says, hey, is this your duplicate? And then there is an option there that says, um, copy all fields or transfer all fields into that new record. So that's a way that you could um, have to have, you can have individual records, um, but they don't, you don't have to individually enter the data 10, 15 times. And this obviously gets more complicated when you have specimens that have 20 different taxa on them. So do you put 20 barcodes on there? Um, it's hard to know and it might just depend on your, um, your curation. But Frank, do you have a comment? Or a question? Yeah, so this is a very common scenario in lichens, of course. Um, so one thing that we do at ASU or that uh, I got in the habit of doing now is also to uh, print out reference cards, because what often happens is that people search for a particular specimen in the collection under a certain uh, record name and don't realize that this is um, another one um, filed under another name, basically, um, because you have that famous rock where you have like several different lichen species on that same rock and so you file the first record and then you don't find the other names in the collection um, and so if you have a cross -re reference card for these other records then it can tell you okay go to this first record to find the specimen yeah that's a really good point so that you're able to find that specimen physically in your collection you can make little cross reference cards and put them in your collection and then also in the disposition field right here, you might want to say filed under and then put the name of the taxon that might be completely unrelated, but where it's actually filed because it was, you know, a mixed specimen of different, totally different taxa. And Alison just asked in the, in, the, in the chat whether we put the barcode on the cross reference card, sorry, and um, Yes and no, because um, we actually have these tiny barcodes that go on the specimen card now. And we have up, set up our label printing that the uh, label will auto automatically print a barcode as well. So yes, when we print out the reference card, that reference card has a barcode, but the original specimen also has one. And, and what the nice thing that you can do about lichens is because you kind of put your specimen um, typically in the center of the card and you gl uh, glue the rock down, you can make little points, uh, pointers or arrows or something that point to a particular specimen on your rock specimen. Um, so this one is rhizocarpon uh, disporum, and the other one is maybe, I don't know, um, Acorospora socialis, and, and then these arrows then are tied to the barcodes. And what I also do is typically when um, I have a collector number, then we often use ABCD for these instances. So um, say somebody has collector number Tom Nash 
2478. Um, then 2478 would correspond to one barcode and one um, kind of subspecimen of that sample. And the other one B would uh, correspond to the other um, record um, or subsample of that particular specimen. Yeah, thanks, Frank. And um, vascular plant people do something a little bit similar that you can see here is they have labeled very specifically which uh, piece of the plant corresponds to which. I've actually seen people take a, a pencil and just like completely circle what belongs to one species versus another. So that could be an option. Not always the prettiest, but it, it is definitely clear. Uh, Megan says that they don't barcode the reference sheet. They just write it on the, on the sheet. It, it probably, again, it depends on your collection. It depends on um, whether you're gonna take a picture with the specimen glued on there and all the barcodes, things like that. So when you deal with folliculous lichens, so lichens growing on leaves, people do that very frequently. They use a permanent marker and, and circle a particular thing that is the thing that they're referring to. And they might yeah. label it to A and B or something. That makes sense that you need to be very clear because you know, you'll have a lot on one leaf. OK, moving on. Um, I think there's just one or two more questions. Um, one question we get a lot, a lot is, where do I put this type of data? Um, and, you know, since that's very, it's very specific, it depends on what type of data you're trying to put in there. But what I wanted to comment on in this question is that um, for the most point, part, Symbiota portals use the Darwin Core standard. So your first question should probably be to go look to, to Darwin Core and see if you can find in, any information um, from the Darwin Core quick reference guide about where they recommend to put any specific type of data and what format it should be in. Um, there's also some little hot links in your uh, date reference or in your data entry format here, where if you click this little tiny green question mark, that's going to give you some more information about what is usually held in those symbiota fields. And then the other comment I wanted to make is that if you don't know, someone else from the community might actually have some suggestions for you. So um, we would recommend putting that question into the Symbiota Discussions Board. This is a um, discussion board in GitHub. You don't have to be a coder to work in GitHub. It can also ask, just act as a forum. Um, but Symbiota Discussions looks like this, and Lindsay's gonna put a link in the chat if she hasn't already. And it is a place where you can post questions. You can look at other people's questions or ideas. You can comment on them. You can tag people. So it's kind of like a little social media outlet, but it's on, on GitHub and it's mostly for symbiotic questions. So that's a place where the community can weigh in because we're facilitators of data. We're not necessarily um, the standards makers. We can point you to standards and to people who are using examples, but we don't always know the answer. Okay, so that is the last of our frequently asked questions that we asked, and it looks like we are ending here right on time, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to ask, uh, or we don't have to stop the questions here. So you can ask questions here, or if you have more questions that you'd like to be answered in kind of a, another date, another discussion date, then we'd be happy to have another FAQ if there are things that we haven't covered. So ask away here, or you can ask away on help, or you can submit questions or topics for future Symbiota support groups. We don't currently have the, um, what is it, it's March, the April topic scheduled. And if you have any suggestions for that, we'd be happy to answer those if something has come up from this last uh, session. Allison, you have a question? Yes, uh, this might be big enough that it should wait to April, but your first topic was really interesting to me because we have CCH2, the California specimens for our vascular plants, we're in the lichen portal, we're in the macroalga portal, and we're in the bryo portal. And so far, for the most part, everything has been entered separately into each of those portals but i've lately had the problem of somebody putting some mosses in 
the vascular plant portal and I wanted to know what's the best way to move them. I mean, in my case now, there's few enough. I can just copy and paste them into the other portal and delete them in the main one, but in the vascular one, but that this is going to come up again. And then the larger question that you guys brought up in my mind today is, well, what is the what is the logical thing for us to do? Is it logical for us to have them in all four portals? And then, for instance, uh, with, for vascular plants, there's all these regional uh, consortia, and we've been narrowly focusing on databasing and imaging in California. But if we start imaging outside of California, should we join the other portal regional portals and put our specimens in there yeah that is a great question um regarding the first part of just transferring specimens that were um inadvertently added to like your vasculars you can also just like download a darwin core archive of those specimens put them into the other portal and then have us batch delete whatever things were not supposed to be in CCH2. Um, but regarding your bigger question of what is the most logical place to store your data and how to um, connect all of your portals, that probably would be a great future discussion topic because I know a lot of similar people, a lot of people have similar questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question. Anyone else? Katie, I have a Just question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Karen. I'm kind of eating my lunch here. No worries. Uh, this might not be a good question, but <clears throat> do you know about bionomia? Uh-huh. I think like, I I don't really get it and how it all like kind of interfaces. So I'm constantly like, oh, I just, I just don't have the bandwidth to figure that out. And I think it would be a good topic just for us to to have as a as a maybe a topic one day or something. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I bet we could ask David Shorthouse to talk to us about bionomia and we could we could comment on how symbiota relates to bionomia. Bionomia <laughs> is a site that um, kind of indexes what collectors and identifiers have contributed to the field. So it kind of gives like an index of all the specimens that someone has collected. And it's really cool and a really awesome tool. It's like being developed, but it works mostly off of data that has been published to GBIF, I think. I don't know if it accesses Symbiota portals yet, but that would be a great future conversation. I would love it because I, I follow David on Twitter and I just feel like it's just above my head. <laughs> Every once in a while, he's like, oh, we just lost like 100,000 records. Um, and I don't know if it's because like you, you, I, these um, are changing when there's a refresh or what's going on, but I feel like I should be aware of it, but I just like, just don't get it. Yeah, it's usually, it's usually a GUID problem. So a problem of unique identifiers having been changed on accident. Um, but that's probably, unless you, you know, they're, they're saying your collection, something changed on yours, you don't have to worry about it too much. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I just wanted to remind everybody that um, you can always pitch us your questions and we can collate them and do another session just like this. And Lindsay just put that right in the chat and also the link on GitHub where we host all these discussions. And this will be recorded and posted on symbiota.org so that you can rewatch it. We went through a lot of material really fast and Katie and Lindsay, thank you both so much for putting it all together. Thanks for being here, everyone. Again, send us your questions and, oh, hold on, let's spotlight on the big group. Bye from the Symbiota Support Hub. Have a great day.